Well, I'm so excited to welcome Jamie Flores back to the Core Connections podcast. So welcome again, Jamie. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be back with you again. Well, Jamie and I can always talk about so many things for ongoing amount of time. And she's been working on some new stuff. And I was like, oh, we've got to talk about this. And so we're going to start off today with talking about the nervous system. And it's something that, you know, I see time and time again, um, and I've experienced it myself as well, that especially if you're dealing with any sort of health things, we'll just say health insert, whatever it is you may be uh, dealing with that our nervous system really, really, really can take a beating. And it's can be what leaves us and kind of what we talk about fight or flight. And I know Jamie's going to go deeper into this, but this is kind of my initial like leading into this of, you know, I see time and time again, that when our nervous system is just heightened and it's on edge all the time, we are just more easily stressed. We have more health issues. We just can't handle life as easily. Um, and so that's, I was like, Jamie, we got to talk about this. So Jamie, can we start with talking about the nervous system? And I know you were saying about how, you know, what we've learned in school is outdated. I totally get that. Cause I get that of course with pelvic floor and fascia conversation, right? You talk about university and what we're learning there, like so far behind the times from what actually we know about pelvic floor and fascia. So I'm excited for you to talk about that within our nervous system. So go for it. Yeah. Gosh, there's so many places I could start. Um, I think one of the things, and this we'll, we'll get to, even as we talk about Um, the body and how we work with the body is that one of the things that I think is really helpful understanding of the nervous system is that, you know, our nervous system, the old, it has multiple parts and the oldest of which is 500 million years old. So this is like, these are the basic building blocks of life and like how organisms continue to survive on this planet. So we have this deep ancient system. It's like our hard wiring or our hard drive of our, of our bodies, our systems. And you know, our autonomic nervous system, which is our system that regulates how much energy we take in and expend and release all of that. It's all governed by this autonomic nervous system. And this autonomic nervous system happens below the level of our cognitive awareness. So it keeps our blood pumping and regulates blood pressure. You know, it keeps our heart beating. It regulates our breath. It manages um, our, you know, our various organs. It's, it regulates metabolism and sleep, all of these sort of cyclical and really all these essential body, bodily functions are regulated by the system. But another thing that's regulated by the system is our sense of self-protection. So I have a teacher that calls our nervous system like our special ops team. It's like they're the best of the best. They're highly, highly trained and they exist for one purpose, which is to keep us alive. And so this system is this brilliant protective system inside of our bodies. And so, you know, and I like to sort of liken this to, um, because this is our animal body, you know, I like to talk about it, like, as if we were talking about other animals, it can help us relate to this concept. um, Because we sometimes forget that we have these animal bodies that have their own ways of being. And so when, you know, we can talk about all the names of the different parts of the system, but basically our system you know, this, this autonomic nervous system exists to keep us safe and exists to keep us alive. So if we're out in nature somewhere and we're with our community of, you know, our little pack, our little community, our little group of animals, whether we're gazelles or foxes or wolves or whatever we might be, you know, if we sense danger, um, our system is going to come online right away without us. We don't think about it. We don't decide to protect ourselves. Our systems leap into action. And so we have something called neuroception in our nervous system, which is constantly like every moment devoted to your survival, deciding whether your environment is safe, threatening, or uh, uh, safe, dangerous, or life-threatening. And so if it perceives that you're in danger or you're in a life-threatening situation, it's going to come online and respond. So And it's going to respond in a variety of ways, which we could talk about further. But what's important to recognize there is if you're in a situation where your system believes that you're under threat, 
you know, when we talk about health, you know, certain systems in our, in our bodies will be shut down in order for us to conserve and utilize energy in order to fight or flight, you know, to flee the threat, to fight the threat, the threat or to shut down. And so, um, our, we don't need our immune system when we're running from a beast, right? Because it doesn't matter whether we get a cold, like our nervous system is triaging for our immediate needs. So it's bringing the blood to where it needs to go. It's not focusing on digestion in those moments because it has other functions it needs to prioritize. And so part of the way that the nervous system connects with our health is that um, if we have chronic stress, if our nervous system is constantly on guard and believes that it's under threat, which a lot of us experience on a daily basis for lots and lots of reasons, uh, you know, our immune function is going to be compromised. Our digestive function is going to be compromised. Our sleep is going to be compromised because the system is prioritizing self-preservation. So that's a whole lot. I'll pause for a moment and see where you want to go next, Erica, because there's so many things we could talk about in, within that. Oh, I know. I was just letting you go because I was like, there's a lot to unpack here. And yeah. I feel like wait, one thing you said that I just wanted to reiterate, because a couple of weeks ago, I did an episode talking about our digestive system and our pelvic floor function, kind of connecting the dots. And I had said something in there and uh, Shelby, who edits my podcast, she was like, Erica, you said something that really stuck out to me. And it was the whole idea that digestion actually starts even before we put food in our mouth. Right. And coming back to what you said, if like, if we are, if, if our body thinks it's under attack or is super stressed out and we are then likely eating really fast, or maybe we're skipping meals or we're just eating mindlessly, um, that can add to that stress. Um, right. So there's so much to say about just slowing down when it comes to eating, right? There's a lot, there's a line, there's a lot of research out there, right? Just mindful eating, just sitting down, not doing anything else, but really, really, you know, just enjoying that food that you're eating and seeing it nourishing your body. And all of that can actually help improve your digestive system, but it, it comes back to this whole nervous system function, right? So I think that's really interesting because digestion is something that I end up talking about so much because it relates so much to dysfunction of health in one way or another or pelvic floor dysfunction, right? It's all interconnected. So that's why we wanted, I wanted to talk with you today about the nervous system and all of this. So with that said, and this is something that actually came up in a conversation I was having with a friend actually earlier today about stress in general, right? How is it like, I mean, cause I have a lot of conversations with a lot of women. I know you do too. And I feel like a lot of women say, Oh, well, I don't really feel stressed, right? Like I, I, I don't feel like I, I have a, a stressful life, but yet they have this health issue or that health issue, or they may have moments of stress that they're aware of. So can you speak to that for so many women who are like, well, I don't really feel like I have a baseline of stress, but like you and I would look at them and be like, well, you must because there's something dysregulated. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a couple of ways we could take this question. Um, one is that, you know, we may perceive one of the things that comes up is that we may perceive one, we can get acclimated to levels of stress that our body is perceiving. And again, so I think it's so key to understand that most of these functions, you know, this self-protection protective function and all these pieces of how the nervous system is impacted by our lives. A lot of it is subcortical. So it's not conscious. So we can think something like, oh, my life is really peaceful. Our bodies could be having a really different experience. You know, it also, you know, when we look at chronic illness, it can also be a result of past traumas that haven't that haven't actually, like we might have resolved it in our mind. Like we've thought through whatever the situation was, we've made peace with it, we've shifted our story, but our body's still holding the charge. So that leads me to that second piece, which is that, you know, we don't, we can't, it's not necessarily our goal to eradicate stress in order to tend the nervous system. You know, all animals, if we think, and I'll always go back to the animals because, you know, we really are looking at the animal body you know, all animals experience stress, they go through shock, they go through loss, they go through almost being eaten by a predator, you know, um, on a regular basis, but they complete the stress cycle. 
So one of the things that I think is really helpful to recognize is that we can, we can resolve a stress in our minds, but not have that energy discharged from our body. So that's why, you know, we can talk more about this in, in a, in a while later, but the somatic piece, which is really meeting the body on the body's terms. So the reason that wild animals don't get stuck in a traumatized state is because they discharge that energy. They complete the stress cycle. So a lot of us are walking around, whether we experience like chronic stress, like, oh my gosh, I'm always overwhelmed. There's all this stimulus in my life that is creating this self-protective response that makes me feel scared or irritated or nervous, whatever it could be, um, or shut down, withdrawn, apathetic, you know, all of these, these are all states in the nervous system or correlate to states in the nervous system. We you know, we're holding charge from our past experiences. And so part of, part of this, um, you know, how do we deal with stress is being able to complete those stress responses. Okay, Jamie, can we talk about that then? Cause I can tell you, this is something I've personally dealt with and I've done a lot of work with stress and there was well, it was through my health stuff, you know, a handful of years ago where I actually realized, cause I was able to get myself and maybe for me, it was more of that conscious, right. Out of that stress state. And, you know, and I've had other conversations with women where a lot of it can start for some that feel like they didn't have a lot of trauma or things in their life. It could start in college, right. Or it could start maybe when you have kids or you're working, you're like, we're doing a thousand gazillion things at one time. And so it can kind of just accumulate over time. Um, or maybe it is like you said, from past illness or past things that we think we've resolved. But I know for me, I recognize that, oh gosh, I was actually living in a higher state of baseline stress than I realized. And I was able to finally get a handle on that. But then I still question with what you're talking about, like, how do we know, right? Um, if we were able to complete that full, full cycle, right? So can you talk more about what that all entails? And I'm sure you maybe can't have a, like a full answer here in one quick conversation, but like, yeah. what can that kind of look like for someone or the potential that's out there? Yeah, gosh, there's lots of places I want to go with this question. <laughs> one, I will say that, you know, a lot of times, and this is just how we've been trained in our culture is that we're our mind wants to do all the jobs. Like it wants to be the Swiss army knife of our existence. And if we forget that there are other informers, other tools at our disposal. So we can think we know what something is about and we don't often know. So, you know, I've heard story after story of somatic practitioners, for example, where someone walks in with a particular story, like, oh, I think I'm shut down around my sexuality because of this. And they actually find, you know, maybe they think it's a relational thing. That's the story that their mind has created. And they go in and the body actually shows them that there was an experience they had as a younger child where maybe they couldn't move their bodies in the way that they needed to at that time or some kind of um, intuitive movement was prevented for whatever number of reasons. Either it wasn't safe to do so, it wasn't socially acceptable to do so, um, whatever situation prohibited that action. And so, you know, we have our story and then we have what the body is holding. So that's why, again, it's like we have to meet the body on the body's terms. So the body knows the body's a great record keeper, right? It re it ho holds in stores, neuroception, you know, it, that one that's the threat detector. It has a whole database. It's like the most epic library you've ever seen. It's recorded every moment of your life. Like that's how much our systems love us. It's just like we're going to keep track of everything for you. And so we have that implicit, like we have all that all of that database that exists below our consciousness. And then we have a little sliver, just like that tip of the iceberg where that our conscious mind is aware of, that's our explicit memory, where it's like, I remember these things, right? So there's a lot in our, in our bodies that is stored that we're not consciously aware of. So again, it's like, we can think we've done the job, like, oh, I went to talk therapy and I talked out that conflict with my family or whatever it might be, or my partner, but our bodies may still be holding things. So, so I, I like, I want to just interject and reiterate the iceberg analogy. I think that's a really good one here. So like the tip of the iceberg you see over the water is really like your conscious brain. Like, so if you've done that work, which, which I do believe, um, is, is a part of it, right. When I work with people who've had, had a lot of sickness and things, and they kind of are in that, like, they don't even know, or can't ha or have a hard time even visualizing life without that as a part of their life. Right. We have to work on that conscious part of it, but then there's all this deeper stuff that's below the water that right. is 
maybe a little bit trickier to address and we got to address it a little bit differently. It takes like, it's just yeah. like this army knife. Like we need a different tool. We need yeah. a different tool, right? So yeah. instead of the mind being like, no, look, I've got my, look at, look at all these tools and tricks I have, you know, it's like, no, 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 we actually need this other tool. And so the tools of the body is actually like, and this is this, I'm going to say this and it's going to be like, oh yeah, but it's actually quite profound, especially in our culture is how are we actually in relationship with our body? You know, how aware of it are we? Do we trust it? Are we in good relationship with it? Or are we like, why is it always acting up? Why can't I get in line with it? You know, and that's, and that's really understandable when we have chronic health issues is that we feel like maybe our body's against us or we just can't understand what it's doing and we can't seem to, you know, but again, it's that difference between like, I need to control this thing and I need to, like, I need to be in charge. I need to dominate it versus like, I'm in a relationship with it. So even if we think about our relationships, like what relationships really go well, if we're like, I must control you at all times, you know, or like, I don't really trust exactly. you. I guess I have to deal with you. It's like our best relationships happen when we're like really curious about them and we're able to listen to them and we're able to hold space and go, huh, you're having a different experience of this. Just tell me about that. And so that's where the somatic healing part is, is that we have to meet the body on the body's terms. So we have to find a way. And again, it's going to sound like, oh yeah, befriend the body, but that's mm -hmm. some of the deepest work we'll ever do is coming back into that um, really healthy relationship with our body, which we're not trained, you know, in our oh. culture to do. So it's nobody's fault. If you're listening, you're like, I don't love my body. I don't feel like it's a friend of mine. That's okay. You know, our, our whole system is designed to teach us to dominate, control, contort, and make our bodies behave. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, oh yeah. Jamie, you are speaking my language. I, I mean, I know you know this cause you've done core rehab, but I'm like always, always talking about like, we have to learn to work with our body. And like you were saying, like our body holds so much stuff, which is why I'm so excited to have this conversation because when I see students starting to move in core rehab, and so many of them are like, my body's not doing what I want it to do. And this, they just go down this deep, dark place. And I'm like, but no, 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 we cannot force our body to do what we want it to do. We have to allow it space. We have to allow it the techniques, and then we have to be open to learning. And I think that's just such a big piece. Like you said, it's like a societal thing. It's like, we want to control it all with our mind. And that's why I tell women all the time. And I, I love the word experiment. Um, I find myself using it more and more with clients. It's like, okay, you know what? Just go in very lighthearted and open and like, let's experiment with your body. And I think when we do something like that, then we're not necessarily like, oh, this is going to be the outcome. Like, I know we all want an outcome of something. And I, and I talk about this a lot in a, in a sense of like, okay, you may have this goal, whatever it is. Say, for example, like you want to heal your pelvic floor. Okay, great. You want to get rid of the incontinence. Great. But you have to like put that goal up on a shelf and know that we're headed in that direction. And between point A and getting to that, you have got to be open to exploring and seeing what else comes up. And it's so amazing when women really embrace that, even just through the movement piece, because that's a big step in the right direction. They get all these other results <laughs> and so much more like learning about their body. And I think that is something that we have got to keep changing as a societal way because women are so judgy of their own bodies. We're trying to compare to everybody else. And it's like, look, like you are on this journey and it's your journey. It's your body. It's your experience. And honestly, the more you force things to happen, the slower they happen. And I preach it all the time. I'm going to say it again, but I'm sure you see it all the time too, Jamie, right? Like the more you're like trying to like control whatever's going on with the, your health or your body or whatever it, it is, the, it's like, then there's more of that tug of war and inner, and then you're just like heightening your nervous system even more, right? When you're doing that. Totally. <laughs> I love this. And that's one of the reasons I love your book so, so much. And I think it's so brilliant. Um, I want to try something out. I want to actually okay. like look at this through the lens of our three primary nervous system states and like this approach to the body. Because when I hear you speak about an experimental mindset and being curious and showing up to what's present and being slow and being open, that's all like, those are all characteristics of our ventral nervous system, which is our system where we're open, we're connected, we're curious, we're grounded, we're present. You know, that is this regulated nervous system state where we're like, 
I think I can, you know, I'm, I can, I can show up to this. I can explore what's here. I can be curious. I can be in awe, even like what is going to happen today? You know, it's this really open present state, which is really, you know, synonymous to like our experience of joy, safety, connection. So we want to approach our body from that state to the best of our capacity. Now, the, 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 the active self-protection, the two primary states are our sympathetic nervous system, which is like under the umbrella of the sympathetic is fight and flight. So it's approach and withdrawal, right? It's the, those two. And that's, that's a normal, natural, brilliant part of our system. But we're, when we're in that place, we're like sped up. Like I, this is the state that says, oh my gosh, I have to, right? It's like looking at the 50 emails in your inbox and you're like, oh my God, I have to do this right now. Like there's, it's tunnel vision. It's like drive, we expect result. We go in and control because that system says we're under threat, but there's something we can do to fix it. And so when we approach the body from that state of like, you must do this now, you know, this is like, even as I speak, I can feel it. It's like my body's getting tight. My breath is getting shorter. My heart's speeding up. And that's the place that we approach our body from a lot of the time, which is like, come on, you just need to do this thing and you need to do it now, right? Or we're avoiding, right? We're in that flight response where we're like, I don't know, something's wrong here. I'm worried. I just don't want to. And we, we can't stay. We can't keep that presence. We're sort of like, actually, I need to run. Um, so that's one of the places, you know, if we're, if we're in that. And that can be that tug of war, too, of like, you know, I want to, but I can't or I have to, but I can't, you know, I mean, that's, we're also getting into sort of like a freeze state, which we could talk about more. Uh, and then there's the dorsal complex, which is this third state. And this is, so this is as if like the, the beast that is coming for your animal body is like right here and there's nothing you can do. The dorsal state is like, it's like the turtle going into its shell, the body shutting down. This is like, there's nothing I can do here. Like there's no hope. I'm not even connected. So this is where we actually aren't even in our bodies. We've already left. It's like our brilliant systems are like, I love you too much to experience this pain, this, this life-threatening danger. So I'm just going to not even, we're not even going to be here for it. And so that's that same kind of like that checked out kind of like, I'm not even here with my body. I don't believe that anything could ever get better. You know, like, especially those of us who have chronic chronic issues, which I know a lot of your people do. And I, I've had as well, you know, chronic pelvic floor problems or autoimmunity where we're like, I don't really believe that anything is going to get much better. You know that, and I, you can even tell like on my bot, I'm slowing down. I'm like my nerve, if you can see my body, like I'm starting to hunch over, like everything's sort of shutting down. And we also can't really meet our system um, to, sh to shift if we're in that state, if we're in that state of shutdown. So that was an experiment to see how we could kind of apply this when we, when we look to how we're approaching our bodies, um, when we're, when we're looking to really do the work that you offer so beautifully, which is to come back in and actually tend ourselves and, and change, create change, um, that we ultimately want. Um, it's yeah. difficult to create change when we're in an active state of self-protection. Yeah. So how can someone start? to get themselves out of that they're in they're not even in their body like what's your initial advice for someone to just start to be able to come back to their body yeah yeah so a couple of things one i mean i i gave sort of a partial explanation of these three primary states mm -hmm. i think it's helpful for us to know where we are like oh it compassionately oh i'm in shutdown in this moment or this day or this season of my life like i really am feeling that like disconnected i don't really want to be here you know i'm not really feeling super hopeful just to be able to be with what is and recognize like that's the place i'm in um really each system has its own sort of best practices um, and i have a whole six week aversion coming up of all lots of practices that we can do but one of the things that i think just basic that's important to understand, like, how do we begin one with compassion and curiosity about my, our system? You know, I think it's helpful to know we all have a nervous system, you know, active states of self-protection are natural and normal to the animal body. So we all experience them, you know, to recognize that we are experiencing one and to bring ourselves that, that calm connected one, you know, to be able to be like, I see you. It's okay. Like, mm -hmm. we're going to be right here with what is, 
and to begin to show. So this is what's so important is we need to show our systems, not tell them that we're safe. So the thing about neuroception, I'll just go jump back for a moment. It's, it's the one that's act, it's detecting whether we're safe or dangerous. It is assessing both real and perceived threats. So there could be no beast at the door, but our systems can feel like there is. And that's part of the, the state of being in a chronic stress is our systems are like, there is this constant, you know, uh, wildebeest in my face. Like I am, I am in constant danger. And so we can't just say, no, you're not, yeah. you're not in danger. The system's like, yeah, there's a lion, <laughs> you know? <And> right. <laughs> oh no, we're fine. Like that we're fine or you're okay, or this is okay for you. Or, you know, um, any of the override that we're also well-trained to do in our bodies from almost day one, um, we actually have to show our systems that they're safe. So there's lots and lots of ways to do that. Movement is one of the greatest, um, which is, I love that really <laughs> intersection here, like movement because our bodies need to move. Like think about mm -hmm. if the gazelle is being chased by a lion and it gets away. What does it do? It shakes its entire body out until all that stress is gone. So movement is a great way for us to discharge stress. It's just one of the inherent pathways in our animal bodies that uh, discharges that stress response. So movement can be really great. Um, breath and sound can be really great. Um, orienting to our environment, like letting the body actually experience, hmm, there is no lion, you know, like there is no lion here, like actually orienting to our environment and seeing the safety that's there. Um, experiencing a, a connection with our own systems, being able to, so I love like the work that you do, even, you know, I've gone through co poor rehab, um, your program. And like, I remember beginning, it's been some time now, but, you know, just working on pelvic tilts and then like, <laughs> oh, yeah, this is like the easiest, you know, easy, like, come on, like my nerve, like my sympathetic system is like, come on, we already know this, let's carry on. But as I stayed with it and got really slow with it, I began to increase my connection to my felt sense. And I think I actually called you the day that I felt my deep core turn on. I'm like, oh, you know, like, oh my God, what happened? And it, it came from slow presence, mm -hmm. slow, slow presence with my body. Like, okay, we're going to keep doing this. We're going to keep ex opening up and expanding. Like, it's like we slow down and we can actually feel more, you know? So yeah. So Jamie, I, here's a question around yeah. this because right. That is the, that is the initial kind of hurdle for so many when they get started. It's that like their brain is like, Oh, well, I already know this. I'm going to just keep going. But it's like, it doesn't work as well. It, it doesn't that it won't work. It will work, but it will work a hundred times better when we allow our body to slow down and really like in tune with our body, but that's a lot of what's going on there, right? Everyone's just so heightened in their nervous system. We're living in a stress state, whether we realize it or not. And we just want to like, it's one more thing on our to-do list that day. And it really needs to not be looked at as a to-do. It needs to be looked at as a healing practice for yourself. And I've been trying to say that for so long. And the women that get it, I mean, it is profound and it is incredible. And I can say the same thing, but until someone's really ready for it, I think they're not fully getting it. But that's why like, I think maybe some of this conversation with the nervous system can help explain to others why, and, and that awareness of why initially, like they want to just plow through, just do the movement and be done with it and check it off your list for the day. Right. And that can be great but there's so much more to learn and discover. And I think you said this kind of at the very beginning of our conversation, right? We hold a lot of stuff in our body. And I've talked about this with fascia in particular, like we know through science now that we actually hold past emotion, past trauma, big T's, little T's, however you want to look at it. And it kind of comes down to how the body perceives it. And we end up holding so much stuff. And because we know that fascia wraps around every single nerve in our entire body. That's why this conversation matters, ladies, <laughs> everybody listening. Like that's why this matters so much because, and I think this is where women get a lot of that tug of war in their body because we 
can do so much with movement, but we have to recognize like, oh, we have to slow down. We have to allow our breath to expand. We have to let go. And I think, I don't know if you can add anything to this, but like, you know, I talk a lot about like within the pelvis, especially for women, we know we hold a lot of past junk in our pelvis, in the tissue, in the pelvic floor. Right. So why is it so hard for women to like, let go, right. It's that nervous system. Like, 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 I'll just like allowing, like you said, shaking your body or just like being, uh, you know, but obviously like poor posture or whatever, that's not what I'm talking about, but like actually internally in your body, like letting things go. Because I find, um, I find that that is, that is a piece that so many women have a hard time with. Cause I talk a lot about, okay, let's learn to release and relax our pelvic floor. And I think, if women can understand more what their nervous system is doing within that, like we're always hold, hold, hold everything. We actually have to let go. I don't know. Is there anything you can like speak to that? To add to that? So much, so much. Well, I mean, really that, that chronic tension is a, is a chronic state of the sympathetic self-protective nervous system. So part of what's required, and this is why we have to work in the body, in the body scape, is that in order to let go, in order to soften, I've taught, I've been talking actually this upcoming program I'm offering is called the soft animal. And we think of soft as weak, but soft is actually the opposite of hard. You know, like we have like a, a healthy animal body carries no unnecessary tension for the moment, right? So an animal can be, can fly into fierceness and activate its whole system and protect itself and protect its young. And then and then if it can't come out of that state and come back into softness with its little cubs or whatever it might be, then it's going to bring all that activated energy back to its den, you know, back to its, its relationships. And so because we live in such a sped up world, our systems aren't designed for this speed. And so our bodies are in this chronic bracing, right? This tension, this sympathetic, it's an activated self-protective nervous system state because our bodies you know again this system is 500 million years old the mammalian system the one that is about connection um that system is 200 million years old like how long has instagram been alive how long has the internet been around how long has you know the nine to five you know like how long has giant have giant cities even existed where there's all this stimulation our right jamie i feel like i feel like we are all living in this state of something that is not sustainable for generations to come, right? There has to be a shift somewhere so that, because, okay, kids today, right? Like, even though I, like, we have really, really, you know, hard boundaries on things, but my kids still have a phone more so that like, I can get a hold, we can get a hold of them, right? It's not their phone. It's our phone that they get access to, but we don't do social media with kids and all that. But they're bombarded with it just in their world by other people that have it and all just all these things. And I just think, oh my gosh, like us as adults, right? We are seeing an increase in health issues, an increase in just all sorts of things under a health dysfunction umbrella, right? You name it. And I'm like, what's going to happen with this, with our kids, right? Um, like your daughter's a little bit younger than my youngest. And it's like, okay, but they're growing up in something that we didn't have until we were more adults, at least. So we are at least in a different part for our brain and our body, I would say to handle it better, but I don't even know about that because it's, we're not designed to have all this stimulus. So for me, I'm like, okay, that's just something I started thinking about. I'm like, well, what's going to happen with this next generation? And then after that, like their kids, like, like, is and this is a question that none of us can really answer, but I think I guess it comes down to having these conversations and having more awareness that we as individuals have to work on our lifestyles to create the environment for us, our family, and our kids to mitigate as much of all of this just bombardedness with stuff. Like, I mean, I'm usually someone who's very, very aware of the time I'm on social media. Like I like, cause I want to interact. I want to talk to everybody. Right. So I try to check messages. I post, but I will tell you, I mean, I'm so aware. And every once in a while I catch myself, I'm like, wait, I just wasted the last 15 minutes of my life. Like looking, like I went down rabbit holes, looking at this or that. And I'm like, 
oh my gosh, like not that it was necessarily a waste. Maybe I found something good, but sometimes I'm like, why did I do that? Right. And then that almost adds stress because you're like frustrated that you even had that opportunity to like do that. Does that make sense? So that was a lot. And I know you cannot really fully answer that whole statement, but I guess it's something for me as a mom, you're a mom. I I mean, those are things I think about with all of this, right. (laughs) As well. It's huge. There's so many pieces that I want to speak to. I mean, one, I'll just say quickly, um, when, you know, cause we can, we, and I know it too, I have a, a very healthy inner critic or not so healthy, but very alive. and active. <laughs> um, we can get on ourselves, but actually like from a nervous system perspective, like that's why social media works is that it, it actually, it, it's, it functions on our, on our system, uh, our ventral system, like our nervous systems, our, our social structures, we are wired for connection. We are built to be in connection with others. We are driven toward that. That is that 200 million year old mammalian system at work. It's brilliant. We want to connect. And so social media gives us this um, kind of like fast food version of connection, you yeah. know, where we're like, it's giving us that it's meeting that deep need, a biological need, um, but not necessarily in the ways that our system is fully adapted to. So that was one thing I wanted to say. The second I wanted to say is that, you know, we are faced, this is a big, I mean, we could probably talk for hours or have a whole summit of like, how do we actually raise healthy children? How do we be healthy ourselves in, I mean, and you, you know, some might not agree with me, but in a toxic environment, like we live in this Petri dish that's like severely compromised, you know, and there are things that are not sustainable, that are not good for our organic living systems. And so how do we do this? And I think a piece of it is, you know, um, because it can, again, we can get into a nervous system state and activate a nervous system state by feeling so overwhelmed with the state of the world, right? And when we get into that, we're either going to get into like fight, like I have to do something, I have to do something now, or flight, like I just have to run away from it all, or freeze where we're like, I have to do something, but I can't, and we're just like caught in these eddies. We have to find a way to become safe for ourselves. So that's why somatics is so important. Like we, our bodies are our prime, we are in prime relationship. Like the relationship I have with my body is primary. Like the best gift we give our children is a regulated nervous system. You know, um, so there's a lot of ways where we have, we have to start small. We have to start, I mean, it's so cliche to say it's like an inside job, but we have to be able to bring it in and, and, and it's very revolutionary. It's very anti the Petri dish because we have to go against that in order to create something new. And so, um, you know, doing the things that actually really nourish us. You know, we could talk a lot about like what can we do for the nervous system, but even if you're, if I, if you don't come and take a class or anything, do the things that your body loves, yeah. you know, and it might be a bath for you. It might not, it might be curling up on the floor with you know, the cat. It might be looking at funny videos of, of animals, like whatever it is that makes you feel calm and connected. It might be going out and looking at the sunset or the leaves on the trees, like whatever it might be. It's like, do more of that. And the more we become, come into safety the more we actually have choicefulness, right? It's not that I have to, I have to, oh my God, it's all, it's all too much. We can actually slow it, but we have to slow down. We do. We have to slow down. <laughs> okay, Jamie. So you mentioned the word somatics a couple of times. So I have to have you explain to everybody what is somatic healing and embodiment? Yeah, yeah. So somatics is really, soma is the body. So it's really about our capacity to be in the body. And, um, you know, it's not just about being in the body. I actually, and I'll say, I'm going to tell a really quick story. I was at this retreat once teaching my embodied movement practice, Koya, one of the uh, systems I'm trained in. I was teaching and I spoke with this, like this famous DJ man afterwards. And I was like, yeah, it's an embodied movement practice. He's like, well, isn't all movement embodied? And I was like, no. And so we had this little healthy debate about that. I'm like, no, it's not. And so really embodiment is like consciously inhabiting our body, like actually being present to it, actually being attuned to what is in, in it and with it, like actually being with it so that we're present and aware of what's happening and we're not trying to manipulate or control it. So that's embodiment. It's like actually being present with what is in our, in our bodies. So we talked about that a little bit already is like, can we actually be in our bodies? And a lot of things take trauma takes big and little T traumas take us out of our bodies. 
the speed of our culture and our lifestyles take us out of our bodies. You know, o- this over mentalization and the digital like world takes us out of our bodies. So the soma is about coming back into the body. And somatic healing is about healing trauma where trauma lives. So trauma doesn't live. It doesn't originate in the mind. It lives in the body. And then the mind creates stories about it. But really like somatic healing is about being, being with the place where it is. Like you can't heal if you're not actually present. Like if there's no one home to heal and feel it, like you can't actually, you have to come home um, to the body. And so that's a large part of it. Um, And really our somatic patterns like create how we experience our lives. It's like, this is the foundation. Our bodies are the foundation upon which everything is built. So even like attachment theory, which is really big right now, um, like how do we bond and connect with others and relate with others? It's all patterns of the soma. It's all patterns Mm -hmm. of the nervous system that are, that have become habituated enough where we're like, that's how I act in relationships. That's how I act in my business. You know, do I have the capacity to be curious and present or am I in that? Like I have to do now or that I simply can't do, you know, it, it all proliferates yeah. out. And then with our healing journey, do we feel open and curious the way that you teach is like, can we slow down and really be with what's here and be good friends to our bodies um, and then move from that place? Or are we coming from a place of manipulation and control and like results? Like you have to perform. Um, like whoever like thrives when they're like, you must perform, you know, (laughs) (laughs) even the cat. (laughs) (laughs) So that's a little bit. So somatic healing is really about um, relational repair with ourselves and really coming back into right relationship and in present relationship and engagement with our own bodies. So can you talk a little bit about like, okay, within somatic, practices like what what is it is it more movement is it meditation is it do you know what I'm saying like explain a little bit more about it (laughs) yeah well I named some of the things um which are you know how we attune how we can really come into what is so both inside of our bodies and in the world around us like our immediate environment those Mm -hmm. are some of the practices so we have to remember this is you know, if we think of the soma, you know, this is our sensory system too. Like so much of our nervous system is like the face, right? Like this is, you know, all of these ventral nerves um, or vagal nerve, like nerve parts come into the face. So, um, you know, it's, it's what we see, it's what we hear, it's what we taste, it's what we smell, you know? So getting into the sensory is a great avenue to come back into the body um, to do somatic healing work. Um, there's, there's so much that I could say, I mean, sound breath movement, like just those three are always just like so foundational. Um, and there's so many practices that come from those. Um, and then, so there's also regulation. So our system is a social system. I can literally, our biology is wired for connection. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how are we in right, right connection with our own selves, right connection with others, the natural world, and then even our relationship to spirit. So it's like, how are, are we experiencing safety with ourselves, with mm-hmm. our, our loved ones? You know, how do we create that safety? Um, so that's some of it. Uh, but really, I mean, really the basis of somatic healing is, um, meeting the body on the body's terms and I show, love it. not telling it that it's safe, you know, we have, I, to show. we have to, I think that's like, just that piece can be so profound to get women and men, but mostly women listen, right? Like getting them to stop fighting with their body and stop yeah. judging and improve that relationship. Right. Um, it's, it's so needed and it's something like we need to then pass down to our children, right? We've got to embrace this and teach it, teach it to our kiddos. So, um, so Jamie, I know you have a program, um, coming up. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? Um, cause I think, I feel like everybody listening can benefit myself included. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. There's one more thing I want to say before. Yeah. Thank you. He was like in there as he was speaking. Um, 
Oh, this is the last thing I want to share. And then I'd love to tell you more about the program. Um, one of the things, so I think I mentioned in the beginning that this system of ours, this brilliant protective system of our autonomic nervous system is like a special ops team, right? Mm -hmm. so can you imagine if you had, and I hate to use like a military metaphor. I wish I could find something better, but I, this is what I've got right now. Um, if you have a special ops team and it's like, its job is to protect you at all costs, right? Like if it just lays around like drinking, you know, soda and eating chips and watching TV before the big, before the big deal, right. Which could be like, we're just going to equate that to like a really stressful situation. It would not have the, the skills it needed to, to do the big, to, to show up for the big event. Right. So those kinds of teams, those special forces, they practice, they practice, they practice, they simulate, you know, they do all of those sorts of things. So one of the things, you know, we don't want to just use the tools of somatics when we're like in a really highly elevated stress state. We actually want to use them. We want to begin to incorporate them in all the time. Um, and in a culture where we're just kind of obsessed with like the big and the intense and the massive breakthroughs, like it's, it's antithesis to that. So it's really about how do we show our body all the time that we're safe. So as I've begun, so I'll just kind of share how it shows up in my life as I've begun to really integrate this, like I find myself in a social situation and I'm like swaying my body. You know, the thing about we sway babies, like it's actually really calming to the nervous system. I just find myself swaying. I'm like, people are gonna think I'm weird, don't really care. You know, like yeah. I know when I start to notice I'm feeling that sympathetic activation in my body, like I'm driving to get my daughter at school and I'm like, there's traffic and I'm like getting revved up, I will use my practices. So one of the, I love to use sound, so like, and my daughter knows like, oh, mom's booing again. You know, there's this <laughs> boo sound, which is really, really good for the nervous system. It tonifies the vagal nerve, boo, like really low. And so I'll do that throughout the day. If I start to notice charge, I'm like, oh, hi body, you're feeling a little activated. Let me just give you, let me just give you some, some goodness right now. And so it can look like swaying. It can look like, I'm just going to take a moment between calls and just like look outside and look at how like how regulated nature is right now, you know, and really let my body feel that, you know? So again, it's like, we have this idea, right? Like our workout culture, which is like, we work out for 20 minutes hard or an hour hard, and then we're done. Check that off the list. And as you know, and as you teach, this is, this is all, this is, this is in, meant to be integrated into our lives. Right. So oh, how do we absolutely. Do and how do we notice like, oh, my pelvis is really tucked as I sit here all day. And my, you know, like it's about that like perpetual continual exposure to the things that are actually really nourishing and really, really helpful and supportive to our bodies. So it's that integration piece that, so we have to show on a like consistent basis. Um, well, that's just like, you just have to start with something, right? That's what I'm always teaching. It's like, pick one thing start doing it. And it's like and learning anything else, any habits. It's like, just the more you do it, the more it becomes a habit for you. And it becomes a part of your life. And again, I think I said this a little bit ago about, we have to start looking at things as not on our to-do list and checking it off. And I think that's where like, I, I've shifted over the years talking about movement as movement and not, I don't use the word exercise very often. I do, if it like, is if for the right context, but, um, because movement is so much more healing and nourishing for most people than if you think of the word exercise, just the thinking about like, even just right now, if you say the word exercise, that could elicit almost like, Ooh, it's like a little stress. I got to go work out really hard. And like, you know, where it's like, Oh, movement. Well, I'm moving actually all day long. Even if I'm sitting here, like I'm moving my body. I talk with my hands all the time, you know? Um, <laughs> so we're always doing some form of movement. Like you talk about like breath and sounds and all these things that we can work to, and I know you have so many more tools and techniques to teach everybody too, which, um, which is awesome. And I always think too, with learning things that like you have to pick what resonates with you, right? Something might resonate with a friend of yours and you're like, mm, can't get on board with that, but I love doing this. Right. Um, I do that with my kids all the time with things. I'm like, Hey, one loves essential oils. I'm like, great, go for it. The other one loves to listen to tones. I'm like, great, go. Like, again, it gets remembering to like, we don't have to do all the things. It's just, we got to start with where we are today. Right. So anyway, there's my little, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yes. Oh my gosh. I'm so, so on board. And it is, it's a paradigm shift. I think mm -hmm. that's a lot of what we're talking about is it's really unlearning 
what we've been taught and how we've been called conditioned for so long to look at exercise, look at movement, look at the way we take care of our bodies, look at what actually even is health. What is, you know, being, what is wellness? Like these are big, so we can get philosophical, but I won't go there. Um, <laughs> but I will say that part of it too, especially with the nervous system and somatic healing is it's really about taking small, tolerable steps. So mm -hmm. a tolerable step is something that you can complete even if it's not comfortable. So I think it's also great to give ourselves permission. Like even with your work, like let's say we are kind of, you know, like most of us or all of us who've been conditioned with this idea of like results fast, have to move quick, like get in and get it done. We can say, okay, body I, or system or brain or mind, I give you permission to like not be comfortable with what we're doing right now. Like it's okay mm -hmm. for you not to be fully bought into this yet would you be willing to just complete this with me? Like, would you be willing to just sit and breathe and see what comes? We might not have total buy-in. That's okay. It's different. It's new, but can we be with this? You know, can we step toward again, tolerable so we can tolerate it. It doesn't, and this is healthy tolerate, not to tolerate like, you know, abuse or, you know, dysfunction in our worlds, but like, actually, can we tolerate this, this new thing that we're not quite sure about? We're creating new pathways, you know, the nervous system loves what it knows. So it wants us to keep, it keeps us in those states that we're used to. And so in order to come out of those states, we have to get a little uncomfortable. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what we have to do. But it, like you said, it's, and it's, it's challenging that when your brain is like, oh, I don't believe this. We have to challenge that because like you said, it's the conditioning. It's how it's been conditioned. It's like, oh, well, I've always done all these things this way. And even though that person might have pain or dysfunction, it's still really hard for the brain to be like, wait, but I've always done it this way. Even though I'm in pain and dysfunction, it's still hard for me to understand that I could do something the complete opposite and it could be beneficial. But when you say that out loud as a statement, it sounds so silly. You're like, well, why would my brain want me to keep doing it my old ways? But it's because it's that comfort level. It's comfortable for your brain. And I've talked about ego versus intuition. And it's like that ego brain is what keeps us so many times in that, that state of just survival, because that is what is comfortable, but it is not what is actually benefiting us and our health and our wellness and our journey of life. If, if that's where we want to go, right. Getting out of dysfunction, preventing dysfunction, having a calmer, more regulated nervous system. <laughs> yeah. Well, in our systems, you know, again, we can talk, we can call it ego, but it's actually the nervous system too, where the nervous system wants to keep us safe. It's always going to triage. It's always going to prioritize that. And in, in, instead of fighting it and like, oh, why is it doing that? It's actually such a loving, like your nervous system has never let you down. Like it's never been a day in its life confused. It's never been wrong. It might have some systems and some stories that it needs to update. It may have patterns and deep grooves, you know, of, of heading to certain places like sympathetic state, which is that activated state of like, oh my God, I have to, you know, it might have those common pathways and your system is like, this is how we keep you safe. So we actually have to show it some new information. You know, the beautiful thing about that neuroception and that database is it's constantly being updated. So we can bring, we can actually ally with our bodies by bringing awareness like, oh, when I spent that time and I really slowed down, I got to experience this amazing connection with my deep core that I've never had before. This actually does support the, the ultimate place I wanna go to, which is a deeper connection with my body and greater health. So we actually have to, we can update the system. And so it helps us to really notice those things, you know, cause again, we have those deep grooves. So we're like, nope, everything's always wrong and it never works and I have to go faster. You know, we actually have to re, reorient and reshape our nervous system but it's so possible and we can all do it we all have the capacity to do it and there are ways fortunately there's this like proliferation of wisdom that is very much being engaged in the world right now um, about the nervous system and how we support it so there's lots and lots of resources out there including your work including my budding work and and so many others so it is so possible to change it Oh, absolutely. And you've seen it with a lot of women. I've seen it with so many women. It's incredible. Incredible. Um, okay. So Jamie, you have to tell everyone about your program. I know we're coming to time. I don't want to take up too much of your time and I want everyone to, to 
know about it and I'll put the links below in the show notes and everything so that they can find out um, more about it as well. All right. So I have an upcoming uh, immersion called Soma. It's a six week into, uh, integrated experientially based practice. We start October 10th and we run through right before Thanksgiving and we are going to meet the body on the body's level. So I could spend six weeks or longer talking to you all about somatics and we could be in the brain, in the mental channel, but we're actually going to do, um, this immersion is really about practices. So we'll spend a week with sound. We'll spend a week with movement. We'll spend a week with, um, um, uh, with breath, you know, well, each week is a different, um, is a different, uh, focus. Uh, so that's Soma. So it starts on October 10th. You can learn more about it on my website, which is sacredhearthealingarts.com, um, probably forward slash Soma after write it. Uh, and I, at the time of this recording, um, it will have already passed, but on September 26th, I'm doing a workshop on the basics of soma, somatic healing and embodiment. And so you can catch that replay if you reach out to me. I'm happy to share that with you so you can get the kind of the foundation. A lot of which we talked about today, we're going to go even deeper and offer more practices. Um, so feel free to reach out for the workshop. And then please consider joining SOMA because it'll be this incredible container mm -hmm. where we really get to slow down together and practice the things that really can help reshape our nervous system. I love it, Jamie. Uh, will you share with, every, with everyone what your Instagram is so they can reach out to you easily? Yeah, it's at Jamie Flares. So um, okay. probably the notes, but it's J A I M E F L E R E S, and that's I have lots and lots of goodies there about somatic healing and and all of that as well. Awesome! Thank you so much, Jamie. This has been so good, such great, great conversation, and so I'm so grateful for you. So appreciate you. So thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>